benefits, so this is the veterans briefing. It's on benefits, essentially, state and uh, federal. And before I get to tell you who I'm all about, I'd like to learn who you guys are. So, how about, do we have any World War II vets here? Or widows? Korean? Ever? Ever? I have and uh, global war on terrorism? No, I don't think so. <laughs> All right, yeah, see, look at that. Um, how about army guys or widows? Army, right? Happy army birthday. And uh, Marine Corps? Marine Corps. Navy? Okay. Yeah, husband, yeah. Um, how about Air Force? No Air Force? And Coast Guard? Any Coast Guard? It's Flag Day today, so we're getting out flags. <laughs> All right, so I know most of the briefing was supposed to be about aid and attendance, but we're going to cover kind of everything. So if you want to get into more details. Raise your hand and ask questions, and we can stop and move on from there. Um, I'm Carl Bradshaw. I'm the district director of Veterans Services. So there's, there's five towns that are part of the district, and Sutton's one of them. My main office is in Oxbridge. Uh, I spent 24 years in the Army. As I can say, right? We're a little informal here. Um, and I've been a, a VSO doing this for 14 years. So in 2009, I started the city of Attleboro. I did that for six years, and now I've been here for actually last week, eight years. So I live in Northbridge, so I'm local. We used to have hours here at the Sutton Senior Center. I'm going to talk to Michelle about doing that. I'm probably going to ask to do it. Uh, hey, Michelle, do you know if you want to do uh, office hours with me again? We would love that, sure. you want to do um, maybe the third Thursday? Sure, that sounds good. Yeah. 9.30 to 11.30, something like sounds that. Sounds good. Yeah, right. perfect. All right, so third Thursday, starting in July. Come on in, sir. Yeah. What service were you in? Marine Corps. Marine Corps, that's right. We don't care if we're celebrating the Army birthday today. Oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> Are you with him or are you just... I am with him. Okay, let's get you. Here we go. Hey, Dex, how you doing? Okay. He's... Uh, you want to see him? No. Oh, sorry. No, I'm fine. Right. Where are you going? Right there. Over here. Yeah. 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 Today, so oh, it is. Nice. Yeah. All right, so on the first slide, I put down the agenda. I did that because I tried to make it, it look a little busy, but I made it six slides, so I can put one piece of paper and uh, do presentations after this. And it gives you room to put any you notes know, you want to. So uh, we've gone through the introduction. The five towns in the district are uh, Uxbridge, which is the host institution. Sutton, Douglas, Millbury, and Northridge. Me and my uh, full-time assistant, Anne Marie, uh, do the job. We're open Monday through Thursdays in Oxbridge Town Hall. And I'm going to be doing some office hours here, third Thursday of uh, every month. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm we'll have office hours here third Thursday of every month. Oh, no, here. Yeah. Here at the scene center. Uh, yeah. And we're open Monday through Thursday uh, during the week, full time. Okay, if we look at the second slide. So there's a mass general law called Chapter 115. It's uh, essentially a state veterans assistance program. It's what we administer out of my office. So it's a state program, but it's administered locally. Did you want to come in? You can come in. No? Come on in. We're going to spot for you right here. <laughs> you want to just right there? Okay. Well, happy Army birthday. 
So the, the, re, the state of Massachusetts is the only state in this country that has a veteran service officer in every town. So no one takes better care of veterans, their dependents, and widows in the state of Massachusetts. So you're in a good state for that. Uh, so because of that, there are 351 municipalities. And if there's a certain population over 12,000, then a full-time uh, VSO is required. Or they can form a district, and that's what we did in this case. So smaller towns tend to get together and form a district to administer this Chapter 115 program. Um, so the program is based on income and assets. And I won't hide those from you. They're here. Um, this single is 8,400. So when we say assets, we're not talking about a house or a car. If there's a second house, second car, then it's an asset. Um, we're talking about check-in savings, 401ks, 403Bs, IRAs, uh, stocks, bonds, those sort of assets. So to be on the program for a single person, you have to be un under 8,400 in assets, married 16,600. The income limits are 2,400 single, 3,200 in change for uh, married. So if you think you might fit into that category, um, then certainly see me afterwards and I will give you a, a, a document that shows you what documentation we need to put you on the program. But, uh, if you don't feel that you're close to those, uh, those numbers, then uh, Perhaps someday in the future you will be, you never know. You might have a lot of assets right now and then they uh, could run out in the future. Hopefully they will. So that's Chapter 115 if you ever hear about you know, what the heck is Chapter 115. It's the State Veterans Assistance Program. There's uh, about 70 uh, veterans and widows uh, in the five towns that we provide financial assistance to every month. Any questions about Chapter 115? And we can talk to anybody who wants individually after we can talk as well. Okay. Some of the other state veterans programs. So there's a real estate tax abatement if you're a disabled vet, 10% to 100%. And there are various levels. And in fact, Sutton, not only is Massachusetts great for veterans, but Sutton is as well. Because, it's, for example, 10 to 90%, you would get $400 off your real estate taxes every year. In Sutton, that's $600. Uh, yep. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, when it's disabled, the real estate abatement based on being disabled, you need to be disabled because of your service? Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so, 100%, for example, is normally $1,000 off. But uh, in Sutton here, it's $1,500 off. And the way to put in for that is just to go to the assessor's office. It's a, a green uh, application. One fills that out. It, it includes widows. So if the, if the veteran had been uh, qualified for it, then after he passes, the widow continues to, if it's the same house, same location, continues to be able to have the tax abatement. So if, uh, if you don't think you can get in it, we could talk about it afterwards. And you, you certainly, if your husband were 10 to 100% disabled before he passed, and you're a widow, we want to make sure that you get that tax abatement. A lot of times people ask about license plates. Um, there's everything from a veteran's license plate. Uh, with a 214, a discharge paper, you can get a veteran's license plate. Um, that is for the veterans. Um, then it goes up to as far as disabled veteran plate, and there's a lot of uh, sometimes issues with that. So it's not just being disabled service connected, good question, <laughs> disabled vet. You have to be at least 60% disabled to have the disabled veteran plate. In addition to that, you have to meet the criteria for one of those, uh, those placards, one of those handicapped placards which generally is talking about being able to walk 250 feet, I believe it is. Uh, you would have to qualify that from the DMV doctors. And uh, if that's the case, plus your 60% or more, you could have a, a plate that says disabled veteran or would have the, uh, the wheelchair uh, symbol on there. 
so you can park that way. It, it seems to be such a hassle, unless you really want to go for it, to get that I would just recommend get a veteran's plate or whatever kind of veteran's plate you want and keep the, the placard on the windshield. Um, getting it put on the plate can be, uh, can be uh, difficult to do, just put it that way. But if you want to do it, you can go for it. Um, there's also things like bronze star metal plates, silver star metal plates. Uh, if you have either of those, you can get it put on your car. They, uh, they don't cost anything. They don't cost to renew, which is uh, a pretty good deal. This plate, there's Medal of Honor, there's Purple Heart, there's all kinds of veterans plates. So um, if you're interested in those, you can try to look them up online or you can give me a call and I can help you with that. There's a thing called welcome home bonuses and some of the veterans here um, might be eligible and you never knew what they were. Uh, if you're like me, you know, put in for them to find out that you already put in for them. So uh, what I did was I put the number on there and they encourage everybody to call ahead of time and say, hey, I served in the Marines in Vietnam. Did I get my welcome home bonus? You probably wouldn't remember if it was 50, 60 years ago. Um, and they'll look it up, they'll look up your name and they'll say, yeah, you already put in for it, don't bother. Uh, there are various other kinds though. There are Desert Storm, um, serving in the states, there's post 9-11 deployments, uh, all kinds of different categories, and you can get multiple bonuses for the veterans. So um, if you think you fall into that category, the best thing to do would be to call that number, and if they say you haven't put in for it, then they can send you the application, and we can help you with the application. $300. Well. You got 300 Yeah, yeah, so it's different amounts too. It's, 300 for Vietnam, it's 1,000 for post 9-11, it's 500 if you just served in the States, and some of them can add up, some get three or four different bonuses. Yeah. Uh, annuities. So if you're 100% disabled or if you're a widow who's getting DIC, so if you get around $1,500 a month from the Veterans Administration each month, that means that the veteran died of a service-connected disability which means that the widow getting DIC is eligible to get this annuity. The annuity is $1,000 twice a year. It's uh, August 1st and February 1st. Is anybody here getting the annuity? Yeah, so and it's not too big a hassle, right? You, yeah, so I can help with the application. Um, and then every year, two, three years, sometimes I go four or five, They'll ask you, they'll send out a mail in and say, are you still in Massachusetts? Are you still alive? That sort of thing. Otherwise, they'll send the check uh, twice a year, August 1st and uh, February 1st. You think you fall into that category. So Gold Star, that's also someone who has Gold Star parents. If you had uh, a uh, dependent who was a veteran who passed away KIA. Um, so it's basically 100% KIAs and DIC that are eligible. I get those. Oh, dear. Right. Now, my wife, uh, she doesn't own the house. She moved in with me. Does she still get it with my disability 100%? Yes. Yes. So if she's living there, She's that's her primary residence. Yeah. yeah. And then she'll continue to get the, um, the annuity as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Okay, cemeteries. So... There's three of them in Massachusetts, two are state ones. One's in uh, uh, Winchington, which is northwest of Worcester. Everybody who's been there says it's very nice. They encourage people to go there as opposed to Agawam. They're running out of room in Agawam. So Agawam's pretty much at the entrance to Six Flags south of uh, Springfield. So I was thinking of being buried there because then my grandchildren, when they're on the way to Six Flags, they can, uh, uh, they can come visit and stop by. Give them a good reason to go that direction, I guess. So we'll, we'll see. Um, some of the things, like, so Bourne is the national one, right? It's right across the bridge, not too far across the bridge when you go into Bourne. What I kind of don't like about it is it has the flat bronze markers. So you almost don't even see them. It makes it easy for them to, to mow the lawn, but it doesn't look that great. I like seeing, you know, some kind of marble headstone, if you will. So that you'll get that at Agalam, and you would get that at... Uh, at Winchington. If the 
wife passes away ahead of time, she can be buried first. As long as the intent is, that's where the veteran's going to be buried. If, uh, if there are ashes, they have columbrariums. So you can be put into a wall and they take care of the marker and all that stuff. If you're buried there, they'll also get the grave marker from the VA. So everything involved in the burial at one of these cemeteries. And if your husband is in a family plot, um, it's, it's too late because, you know, he, the intention is you would be buried together if you're a widow. So um, it's, it's all free except for if, when that day comes, the DD Form 214, which is the discharge papers, the funeral director would need that. The funeral director would take care of everything, including getting the burials at the state or national cemetery. So that portion is not free. Once they, you know, the remains are delivered to the cemetery, then the burial, the marker, and all that, and the honors would be there as well. That's that's free. Uh, any questions on the cemetery? Bronze, uh, bronze matches. Yeah, they um, they're, they're at Vaughan. Oh, but it's separately. Yes. Yes. So uh, that's another thing we help with. And uh, <clears throat> typical one is 12 inches by 24 browns. And you probably see them in a lot of the cemeteries. <coughs> so we can help. You know, a lot of times the funeral director will do it. Um, but we can get them done if the funeral director doesn't do it. And um, as far as it being put into the cemetery, each cemetery charges a different amount. Some are free, some are 150. I typically hear around 150. Because what they do is they, they'll put in the cement and then they, they have some anchors and they'll bolt it in and they'll put it in front of, or as, as the only uh, marker, if it is, uh, they'll put that in front of the, the, the already existing marker. Uh, but along with that 1224, there are also all kinds of other ones. There's uh, upright marble, upright granite, laying flat on the ground marble, laying flat on the ground granite. Just got to be careful with some of that stuff because uh, the granite ones are 140 pounds. Uh, and I find that heavy myself. <laughs> they're at least a two-person lift and uh, they're tough to get around. And part of the application is you have to go to the cemetery director who has to say, yeah, we'll accept this. Because some are not going to take, the, especially the granite or marble that lay on the ground because then they're going to mow around it and stuff like that. So the cemetery has to approve it. Um, all right, any more questions about that? Okay. Let's go to the VA. So that's kind of on the state side of things. Uh, Veterans Administration, uh, there's several things. And people don't understand about the health care system. So the health care system for veterans only. And if you are qualified for it, you can use it as much as you like or as little as you like. Um, there are two main reasons I tend to see veterans coming in to start it for the first time. A lot don't do it because they have their own insurance and they think, eh, hey, I don't need it. But uh, at some point, prescription costs might go way up. That's the number one reason. And uh, number two is hair and loss. So, there are two ways, and the number one thing I do with the VA in disability claims plus the VA health care is hair and loss. And we're fortunate. Worcester VA has an excellent audiology clinic. You can get in there next week. Uh, they have plenty of capacity. Everybody says great things about them. Um, so there's two ways. You get a service-connected disability or hair and loss which I do at least weekly, or you become part of the VA healthcare system and you can get hearing aids that way. Uh, so another thing too is if your private insurance isn't handling glasses, the VA, if you're in the healthcare system, you can get glasses. So, for, so these are not some cheap, just regular glasses. They are progressive. So I, you know, from the bottom up, I can read, I can look further away, I can look medium range and they're uh, adjustable, or I forget what the outdoor thing is, but they kind of become sunglasses when I go outside. So when I come in, sometimes it'll take a minute or two for, it to, for the sunglass portion to go away. Uh, 
So that's, that's a good part of the VA healthcare system. Another thing good about it is the Worcester Clinic. Just uh, built a new $50 million building. Um, I just started going there in September. I walked in there, there were five people to check in, three veterans. That's how good it is. <laughs> and it's very modern and it's very nice. I was there one hour, I got a flu shot, a tetanus shot, um, prescriptions taken care of. The lab was right next door. I got all my labs done and more prescriptions after that because I'm not perfectly healthy like most of you. But uh, I, they, they mail them to you for 90 days, prescriptions. So it's something to consider. If you want to do it, not everybody qualifies. Uh, so you've got to be a veteran. It's for disabled veterans. If you're not a service-connected disabled vet, then it's based on income. Uh, so single or married, it's around 60000 a year if your income is under that. And you don't meet any of the other special criteria. Purple Heart recipient, POW, Desert Storm, 30 Days or More, Camp Lejeune, um, Radiation, Exposure, <coughs> uh, stuff like that. There's a special category. If you don't meet those categories, then 60000 is about the threshold. Uh, we help with those all the time. It's a three-page form application. Usually you get approved or denied within a couple weeks. You get a primary care manager. And like I said, you can use them as much as you... This morning I went to my civilian private care uh, PCM, and I also have a VA one. And I use them for various different things, depending on what it is. Uh, so that's the healthcare system. If you're not part of it, you thought, Insurance takes care of it and you're happy with it, that's fine. If you want to get involved, then you make an appointment with me and I can help you uh, get that taken care of. Uh, disability claims. We do disability claims, average uh, about one a day, somewhere over 200, just out of my office, somewhere around 200 a year in disability claims. Some of you I've seen there. Uh, who have I helped with disability claims? I know. Okay. Um, Biggest one is hearing loss and tinnitus. That is the correct pronunciation of it. I learned that through uh, part of this whole process. So everybody says tinnitus, right? Uh, but every time I say that around somebody in the hearing realm, they, they correct me and it's tinnitus. So that is the most common disabling feature in the VA. More people have service-connected tinnitus than any other disability. And that's ringing in the ears. Um, if you're lucky not to have it, that's great. Um, if you do have it and you're not getting service connected and you haven't tried for that, then we'd certainly want to try for that. That's 10% to save on 10% right now. It's about $165 a month uh, tax rate. Um, and I'll get into some of the other things. So the newer things. Um, blue water name. So everybody's heard about Agent Orange. And it used to be you stepped foot one day, one moment in Vietnam, in country. That would be, give you a presumption that you were exposed to Agent Orange. And then a list of about 25 disabilities and diseases, most of them cancers. Um, they would presume that that is a result of your one day, let's say, in Vietnam, you were exposed to Agent Orange. Well. Uh, the Blue Water Navy was, guys, some, some guys in the Navy were on aircraft carriers, but they went to Da Nang, or uh, they found themselves in the intercoastal waterways. But even if they're within 12 miles, then it is presumed that they were exposed to Agent Orange. And that, that is just recent, the last couple of years. So a lot of the Blue Water Navy guys who were up off the coast, pretty far out there, never put in for it or got dis their disability just denied. Um, so Blue Water Navy expands that to quite a few folks, and I've done several of those. So how do they know? Well, they actually go to the ship logs, and they have certain dates for certain ships and times. Um, I've had some guys who had their own notes or letters saying they were on the USS This, and uh, they were just off the coast, and we were doing evacuation or something like that. That works too. Uh, so that's Blue Water Navy. 
Anybody think they've fallen to Blue Water Navy and haven't gone down that? I think my husband, I mean, he was in country. He was yeah. in the Navy. Okay. But he did spend at combat time. Inside? I Vietnam guess, something. yeah. So did he ever put in for a disability? For no. Yeah. That's why I'm not yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. So it's not too late if uh, your husband didn't have to have been a disabled <coughs> veteran before he passed. So if we can link his purpose or reason of death to his service, and this is a pretty big list when you can call Vietnam exposure, and if he was in Vietnam, then it's possible you'd get DIC. Um, I don't really talk about that here, so... I use these acronyms, but okay, you don't know what DIC is. It's uh, Dependent Indemnity Compensation. It is for the widow of a veteran when the veteran passed away of a service-connected disability. And the other way is he was 100% disabled for 10 years or more before he passed away. So in that case, it's been 11 years and he passes away on a car crash. That counts. That gives the widow the same amount. Uh, so, for example, right now, DIC is $1,562 a month. It doesn't matter if he was 100%, he had over 3000 If he was 10%, let's say his 10% was something he died of. Um, everybody, the, all the widows get 1500 either way. So the amount of the disability, what he was getting ahead of time, doesn't, doesn't matter. I think that the DIC... Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's 15, 62, 74. Cents. I was going to say, did it say 74 right. cents, too? <laughs> yeah. 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 And that went up. I mean, that went up 8.7% yeah. this year. And it went up 5.7% last year. So these numbers have risen quite a bit in the last two years. Uh, Camp Lejeune, you probably see that on the TV all the time. That's separate. Let me talk about that first, what you see on TV. That is, okay, first of all, you and or your husband were at Camp Lejeune for more than 30 days between August 53 and December 87. If that's the case, it's presumed that you were exposed to contaminated water. If that's the case, then it's presumed that any of the disabilities, a long list of them again, uh, are part of the service. For a widow, it can also mean health care benefits, um, and you can you can sue the government. So this is unique. It's one of the first times in history that a law has been passed where you can sue the United States government. In this case, it's uh, going through the Navy. The Navy's handling the whole thing. You would get a lawyer and put in your claim with the, the lawyer. Um, what we're hearing, and so I have nothing to do with this whatsoever. It has nothing to do with VA disability. It has to do with you suing as a private citizen, the government. So it's separate from that, although if you're not getting a disability from Camp Lejeune exposure, you should probably get that first or during the process because you can't just sue them because you were there for 30 days. You have to sue them there because you have damages, physical or bad damages while you were there. Not too many Marines drank the water there. No, they do better. Ripple wine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they do better. <laughs> so you can do that. What they're telling me is it could be a 5 to 12 year process. They're telling me that there are like three parts of it, and the lawyers can charge 30% on each one of those. So before it's all said and done, they might take 90% of what you get, and uh, it could go on for a decade. So depend, it would depend to me, anyway, on how bad the disability was. So if I had been there and my husband died of cancer, that, and it's presumed it's an exposure to the use of the water, well, that would be a pretty significant thing, I would think, and I would probably want to sue. If, uh, if nothing really major happened, I wouldn't throw my hat into the ring just because you were there. You have to have had some medical or physical issues that 
you know, happened afterward. So that's why you see all the Camp Lejeune, because a lot of lawyers are going to make a lot of money. That's the bottom line. Uh, you see those every day. Any questions on Camp Lejeune? All right, good. The PACT Act. So this is the most new, most comprehensive veterans bill that's been passed probably in our lifetime. Certainly in our lifetime, but probably ever. It was passed August 10th of last year. Um, somebody called John Stewart, who's a, a celebrity, pushed pretty hard. You might have seen some of the news reports, him on Capitol Hill, really pushing hard for it. Uh, he helped get it through. And the PACT Act expanded a lot of benefits to a lot of veterans and widows on three different ways, at least three different ways. So one of them was Camp Lejeune, they expanded eligibility for medical care. Um, it allowed or helped the uh, being able to sue the Navy. Um, Vietnam veterans who it's presumed had exposure to Agent Orange. What was added to it was uh, uh, hypertension or high blood pressure and also uh, MGUS, which is an eye thing, some kind of eye disease. That was added to the list of 23 other disabilities and diseases that were already on it. But, you know, hypertension is, I've been seeing a lot of Vietnam vets put that in because it wasn't presumed before, now it is. And a lot of veterans have hypertension, a lot of males, here, older males. I know I do. So that was a big thing for Agent Orange. The biggest is really uh, Desert Storm post 9-11 and exposure to burn pits. That's really what the PACT Act started from and, and then they added some things to it. So it's presumed another long list of disabilities and uh, cancers. And in, in the case of burn pits, a lot of lung things. The military is not very big on uh, the VA on giving disabilities for things in your lungs, COPD, stuff like that. But just about every lung issue, somebody from August 2nd, 1990 and on, has is almost presumed if they were in the Middle East. And so it's by location, it's by date. Um, and that was a big thing, adding all the lung and cancers uh, to it. And I'm a Desert Storm vet, and I've already benefited from the fact that. So. Uh, that's been keeping us busy in my office, and it's a good thing. Uh, but it's more for the younger, but we have a young PACT Act eligible person right here, because you served after August 2nd, 1990, right? Uh, any questions on the PACT Act? All right. So pensions. So we talked about service connected. Somebody got disabled because of their service. A, just a straight up pension is called non-service connected and it's not very generous so I put some uh, amounts down there so for a widow it's 896 that doesn't mean she's going to get 896 dollars that means if she was getting 800 from Social Security and that's her only income the VA would give 96 dollars <coughs> so up to 896 I don't know too many that would come across who are on that pension. I mean, that's not a lot of money to live off of, 896 a month. So there's not too many widows that actually get that. And for, for the veteran, it's 1336. And again, if he's got a thousand coming from Social Security, you get $336 from the VA a month. So they're not very uh, generous. The other thing with pensions, and as we transition into aid and attendance is a thing called wartime service. So this doesn't mean you have to have served in the combat or in war, but you had to have served during those dates. And I put them down here. Um, like Korean wartime service was from 50 to January 31st, 1955. And then Vietnam from August 64 to May of 75. And then August 2nd, 90 and on has been uh, wartime service. So to give you an example how it wasn't particularly helpful to me and my father, my father was served in Korea, and he did it in 1960, and he 
could have went to assisted living and this would have helped because he would have been eligible for aid and tenants. But because he didn't serve during the right time frame, he's just not eligible for it and didn't get it. Uh, there are some who served in Key Largo and the Coast Guard in 1974 who could possibly get aid and attendance and a pension now. But somebody who served in career during the wrong time is not eligible. Uh, and it's something every time I see a congressman, because it's, it's a federal law, I mean, it's, it's going to be changed by a congressman, or, you know, the Congress has to change the law. I, I always mention that to him and say it doesn't make any sense. So the, the main purpose was supposed to be aid and attendance, and uh, there was a briefing that was going to happen on that. So I'll, I'll give that briefing now, and we help with aid and attendance, and I, I get calls almost daily about aid and attendance. It is a complicated program. It's not easy to get, and I'll tell you how and when the best best times to get that. So the next the next slide is eight and attendance, and there's also it's also called homebound allowance. Now it's part of the pension system, but it's called an enhanced pension because you have additional cost. So uh, let's go through some of the qualifications, eligibility requirements. The veteran has to have served during wartime service. We just covered that. The asset limit, and again, not a house or a car, but anything else in the bank, is 150000 That used to be around eighty, not only a few years ago. So that's gone up quite a bit. Anything under one hundred and fifty is OK as far as assets go. A lot of times, the problem with that is uh, somebody, before they go into assisted living, will sell their house, and now they got, you know, hopefully more than 150000 in the bank. That creates an issue as far as getting this aid in attendance. Uh, then the doctor has to say you need it. And there's a two-page form that the VA has, has us fill out. And it's around two of five acts of daily living. So I, I listed them. This is like, I think I listed seven. Uh, but mobility, being able to get around. Can you bathe yourself, dress, groom? use the restroom, transfer between uh, areas in the house, need help eating. Another one that usually can come up is uh, for safety reasons, like if uh, somebody has dementia and uh, needed help with medications. So the doctor fills that out and the VA decides, well, yeah, you really need aid attendance. You need the help of somebody else. So it's, it's an asset, then it's the, the physical need for it, and then it comes down to, okay, so how much do you get, and what is the benefit worth? The best time to use aid and attendance is if someone is in an assisted living facility. So it's available to widows. Um, it pays a little less for the widow. Um, if both of you are in there, it's a certain amount. So I, I did put some amounts down. Uh, aid and attendance in an assisted living facility, one person would be 2000 229 and for two it would be 2642. So why it works good with aid and attendance for an assisted living facility is because the if the doctor has said that you you're eligible for it and you say well how could you not if you're an assisted living you can be an assisted living and not have any of these issues you know to take care of yourself. Every year for about three years I had a veteran come in and say hey uh, I'm not getting my aid in attendance. And it's because you didn't physically, medically need it. So they didn't count the bill. They didn't count that 5000 a month, which now deducts from his income. And with that not happening, then he wouldn't get anything. So just to give an example, let's say uh, your income is 5000 and the bill is $5,000, um, then your income's down to zero, you could get the max amount, $2,229 or $2,642. If, uh, let's go to homebound care. So you can't get out of the house, generally speaking. You have those same medical issues, and you have somebody helping you within the house, a nurse, um, an assistant, maybe a family member. Well, the VA will take your income and 
they will deduct those costs. So if the income is 4000 and uh, the nurse and the assistant cost 2000 they say, okay, your income is 2000 bucks. So then you look at homebound care for one person, it's 1633 you wouldn't get a penny from the VA because your income after deducting medical expenses and health would be over that limit. If, if it was 4000 and you spent every penny of that on somebody to help, then it would be zero countable wages and you could get the 1633 a month. I've only seen in 14 years uh, one person get homebound care and uh, basically had the assets underneath the 150 with the assets to start spending the money on somebody to provide that all, all that care which costs a lot of money but allowed them to stay in the house and uh, they were able to do that and then get the, uh, the 1633 the homebound care so it's not like a, they're just handing you a check because you qualify or you're eligible it's it's very tricky um, and usually doesn't work too well with homebound care. It does with a system of facility. You can also get it if you're in a, um, a nursing home. The problem is they keep almost all of it. So if you go in a nursing home, you have to essentially, at some point, you'll be in mass health because it's so expensive, 11, 12, 13 thousand dollars a month. So you go to Mass Health, they pay most of it. They give, they allow you to keep seventy-two dollars a month, essentially. If you go ahead and go through everything to get the, uh, the eight in attendance, then let's say it's just the veteran, two thousand two twenty-nine. Great, they're going to take that two thousand two twenty-nine, and they're going to let you keep another ninety dollars. So instead of seventy-two dollars a month to personal needs account, it's called, uh, you would get one hundred and sixty-two dollars a month. You're under eight in attendance. So that's not the best deal in the world. So that's why I say homebound is difficult. Nursing home doesn't do a lot. If you're an assisted living facility, you're heading that way, you can kind of judge, you know, if you can fill that gap. Let's say your income's 3000 and the bill's 5000 and you know you're going to get 2229 then you'll know you'll be able to cover the, the gap with the VA to stay in the assisted living facility. Um, before I go into VA community care, are there any questions about being the tenants? There are people out there who will charge you $3,000 to do the application. I'll charge you zero. <laughs> right. yeah. And this might not have to be under this category, but um, and something we can talk to you about when we have it, but about getting ramps or things like that in the home. Yeah, so that's based on a service-connected disability, and as an application, it's uh, worked through the primary care manager at the VA. Okay. So, for example, the veteran, let's say he doesn't have legs, he's in a wheelchair, needs a ramp, yep. that would be the, the time it would happen, that sort of thing. Or can't, or it's like bound to a, a, a wheelchair. And they, they, they the ramp, they'll, they'll do adjustments to the house, they would do adjustments to the bathroom, find a way to get up the stairs if necessary. So that's based on the service kind of disability. If the veteran got in an accident and lost his legs, VA yeah, is not going to do anything. Yeah, well, he has an illness and he's wheel, wheelchair bound or getting yes. getting to be wheelchair bound, which I don't know if that's tied to Agent Orange or not, but something to explore maybe. Yeah, yeah, we definitely want to look into it. Yeah. VA, so let's say this homebound kid is not, it's not a good fit. Another possibility is if you're in the VA healthcare system, you can get VA community care. So that again is the primary care manager at the VA orders nursing assistance for a certain number of days a month or a week, uh, and that's all handled by the VA doctor, essentially. And I know some that are, are getting that, which is very helpful. Um, the VA is not often the best place to turn to for elder services. I always explain, you know, Tri Valley is there too, and you you got to start with them as well. Try to get any assistance you can get from them, but simultaneously go for the VA uh, and see. And the VA uh, community care is not everywhere, so it's based on your circumstances, where you live, if it's available, that sort of thing. But it's not something to be discounted. You just want to explore that avenue 
if you're having a tough time just living in the house. Uh, that's another option. Any questions about aid and attendance in community care? I don't know if I qualify for right. any of this, yeah. but my first question is service uh, time. My husband went in January 1st of 1955 and served for three years. I don't think that's in that frame. Yeah, it is. It is because uh, it's just one day if within you, a time frame, and it's January thirty first. Yeah, that month, yeah, it's still, yeah. yeah so if he it. entered for January thirty first, and he was in there one day, that's all it takes. Yeah. Good. So that's he Barely. made it just right by a month. <laughs> Barely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we can explore if there's a, a path for you too. Yeah. I should have mentioned that it's just one day. Okay. So let's look at some other things. If you see the, uh, these flags right here specifically at the uh, cemeteries, they, they wrote it by my office and we distribute them to the five towns and there's a point of contact who takes care of getting them out there, usually with the help of Boy Scouts. Uh, to give you an idea, 8,000 to 9,000 we order every year just from the five towns. So, and we get plenty of calls about, you know, my particular flag and Obviously, I can't make sure that 8,000 flags stay there in great shape in the right spot, uh, but we'll offer up a, another one um, in Sutton. It's the only town we help with the, uh, the, the thing to hold the flag into the ground. So uh, you'll see the usually the silver veteran with the flag in it. So any veteran uh, should have that on his grave marker if he doesn't then let us know and we'll let somebody get it put there. Uh, gray markers we mentioned. So those are free. They come from the VA. Veterans are eligible for them. If uh, you want to use it just as your headstone, you can. If you want to add a marker, you can. If you want to just put a medallion on. So I'm doing this for one of my, uh, my wife's uncle who passed away 15 years ago now. And uh, I said, hey, does he have anything? And so I'm going to be ordering him. There's, there's an inch and a half, three and a half inches, and five inches. And you glue it onto the headstone group in the back and put it in the front. It's kind of a why not sort of thing, but it helps with the, those who are putting these flags out. They look for that sort of thing. And they'll, uh, they'll know that that's a veteran's grave marker in there. You need to put a flag there. So we can help you get those. Oh, ID cards. This question has gone down quite a bit. I used to get them all the time. How do I get my veteran's ID card? And again, that's for the veteran. Um, the VA came through a process that was not particularly helpful. In fact, I had one gentleman come to my office three times in a row to try to get it, and we were not successful. And so I spent about two hours trying to get him an ID card. So obviously that's not a good, not a good process. Um, what I normally do is put them up for the VA healthcare system, and then they can get their, their ID card. The question is usually for Home Depot and uh, Lowe's, 10% off. You don't need to use the VA system. You don't need to get an ID card. Uh, you need to, need to do it online. And they have a way they verify that you're a veteran. And then they say, OK, we got you. You're a veteran, and you can get you 10% off. Home Depot only used to do 10% online, but now Lowe's is doing that as well. And Lowe's is doing the same process as Home Depot. I think most of the questions just come because they uh, <laughs> They would only do it on certain weekends. They did it 4th of July, Memorial Day weekend, Veterans Day weekend, and one of the two did Labor Day weekend for some reason. And But they would only do them on those weekends. Sometimes if the veteran had a hat on, they said that's good enough. Sometimes they wanted the 214. Sometimes they wanted to open up a book with all these different, you know, like a, a VA uh, disability card and a retiree card and a regular card and a, a, a reserve. And a, they would have a book that shows the pictures of them, and if the person couldn't find that particular card, they'd say no. Uh, so that's you know that's that's ID cards. If 
your best bet is just to get it done at Lowe's or Home Depot if that's what you're using it for. Uh, My husband has it on his driver's license. That is that's another. What, that's yeah. what he always shows that he gets a discount. Yeah, I was going to say it's it's the store you're at and the clerk you see that day. That's we, good enough for most of problem. them. Yeah. yeah, that's good for good enough for Thank most you. of them. Um, all right, so we do uh, veterans events, but generally speaking, it's Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Generally speaking, I'm in Uxbridge. Um, we we help with them and, and participate in them. We, uh, we get a myriad of phone calls every day. Just like any, I bet you all have probably five questions for me. And uh, they're all different subjects. And uh, we help answer in those, those questions and calls. And then a, a big thing almost every day too is DD Form 214s and discharge papers. We have a state database that I have access to. Uh, so if you're missing one or don't have it, Normally, I can look it up, get it printed out, mailed to you, or even sent email if you want. And uh, like I said, it's a very common thing. I bet you everybody here probably has the 214s. Yeah, I would expect that. So, uh, with that, those are the main things we do. I hope we're probably getting close to time because I see we should. Yeah. No, you can take your time. Nothing's <laughs> happening. So oh, okay. Take your time. No rush at all. So out of all that, that's, I, don't know, I know it's a fire hose, but any questions that you think the whole group will benefit from? And then I'm going to hang around and individually.